Hello, this is Tom Harris, and I'm bringing you today a webinar on soaring between pastors. I am the president of Interim Pastor Ministries, and just a little bit about why I'm here before you today bringing this seminar. After two associate positions after seminary, at the age of 40, I interviewed for a permanent position at a church in Tucson, Arizona, a downtown church that once had been large. When I was with them on that interview that weekend, I realized how much dysfunction they had. And I told them they didn't need a pastor. They needed an interim pastor to help be able to right the ship and get things going correctly. They hired me to do that. And from that first year and a half of ministry, I continued on in another eight churches over a cumulative 17 years, working as an intentional interim pastor. I kept gaining skills, coaching, and eventually I ended up with this organization as one of their interims. Just about a year into it, they announced their president was retiring, and I was one of the ones that made application and was approved be the, to be the third president of this organization. We're a 30-year-old organization that has served over 1,300 churches with one of our pastor members who was sent out as an employee of IPM to lead a church through a very intentional strengthening process. Uh, this is the organization I'm with, and it's been an unbelievable 10 years as we've grown from an average of about 35 churches to well over 80 or more at any one time. I have counted up recently, and I believe that this is pretty accurate, that I've helped 600 churches in a search for their particular need in an interim pastor. And so much has been gained through 15 years of pastoral experience and 10 years leading this growing organization. Um, this organization has a mission that's a little bit more distinctive than just filling pulpits. We actually desire to be somewhat transformational and strengthen churches during pastoral transition for greater effectiveness. That's the mission God has given us. And so we work hard to add value, to give uplift, to strengthen churches while they're in transition in order to have increased momentum, in order to find a healthy pastor to come to a healthier church. Recently, I wrote a book called Soaring Between Pastors, Eight Actions to Thrive During a Pastoral Transition. And I would encourage you to go to Amazon and get a copy. There's no other book quite like this one. And I believe for pastors that are thinking about interim work as a career or as an encore career or a church that's think, thinking about their options of what to do in transition, that this church would be greatly helpful in succession planning. The truth of the matter is all pastors, that's right. Every pastor will only be there for a limited time. Every pastor is an interim pastor. And the truth of the matter is that pastors in churches depart quite frequently. According to Tom Rayner, the average pastor now stays about six years in a church. Thankfully, there's more continuity in healthier churches and churches that have 10, 20, or 30 year pastorates. But truly, transition is happening often in the life of the church in America. Why do pastors move along? Well, some of them get a call to a new ministry, a new church, a new locale, and they're usually excited to go. The church may feel a little bit like, what did you leave us? And they may feel like we're going to um, maybe richer grounds of service, but pastors do move for this reason. They also move because they retire, and we're in the middle of a great uplift in pastors retiring as the baby boomers are now stepping down from pastorates and younger pastors are becoming in their place. Some pastors get dissatisfied for many reasons and they leave. They may feel like they've taken the church as far as they can take it. They may feel that the church post-COVID needs a renewed vision and they don't have it in them after many years of leading, envisioning another peak in the process of 
of, of, um, of visioning. Some pastors leave because they are um, uh, asked to leave. These are not happy times. Sometimes pastors disqualify themselves. I've seen pastors that have been let go that we replaced them with an interim because they committed plagiarism. They got too friendly with sermons on the internet. Um, some pastors just um, have eternal family, eternal family problems, and they leave because of that. Some pastors can't make a true living and provide for their family, especially when they get older and they're going to college. So they, they step up um, out of an economic, and I hope a sense of call to their next ministry. Some pastors disqualify themselves because of adultery. We've seen that many times. And I've helped two or three churches where the pastor had actually stolen funds from the church. One stole 300,000 and over a period of 20 years through a scam through their Christian school, the pastor and the president or leader of the Christian school stole $3 million. So these are eccentric things that happen, but I wanna tell you that pastors leave for a lot of reasons. Now, the thing is there is a usual way forward and I'm gonna introduce to you another way. I dare not say a better way, but in my heart of hearts, I truly believe why wouldn't it be better? A lot of churches hire a traditional interim pastor, usually part-time to preach, maybe come in the office one day of the week, um, do marriages, funerals, those types of things. Um, some churches just elevate an associate to a preaching pastor. I don't think this is good because it sets up the next pastor to have the comparison of his associate. And number two, if the one preaching and possibly leading the staff is doing that from within, it seems to me to take away some of the leadership of the next pastor. Congregations adjust to the change of not having a pastor. Uh, they grieve some and they also gain a sense of future hope. So this is incremental preparation for their future, but often this is inadequate preparation. And then the church calls a new pastor, and often as soon as possible, let's get someone in here. And we know of many churches that have felt under the gun who prematurely called a pastor, and it wasn't a good fit. And then that pastor's departure within a year of the prior pastor's departure leads to a downturn in spirit, often division, loss of congregants, and momentum. Now, I believe there is another way. It's the way of opportunity. That's right. Just ahead on this path, there's all kinds of opportunities. It's built off a Bible verse that says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, walking wisely is directly related to using time. Now, the Bible has a number of words for time. There is a chronos word in Greek, which means measured time, a, a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century. There's also a word that means qualitative time, the right time, or the opportune moment. This is like striking while the iron is hot. So he says, look carefully that you use best, the best use of the opportunity or this moment that you have before you. So we're talking about the qualitative part of opportunity. One of my friends from Canada writes this about the opportunity between pastors. Times of pastoral transition are windows of opportunity for a congregation that seizes the opportunity it can be a transformational turning point toward greater health and missional effectiveness. Walking a new pastor to a healthy, functioning, spiritually renewed congregation is a goal worth pursuing. And this is the mindset of myself and my organization in the book, that we have a period of time that we can steward and not lull. We can um, take advantage and not waste the time between pastors. And I'm going to show you now how there is many opportunities that can be taken that can prepare the church for a more fruitful future. 
So how do we do this? How do we take use of this time? In my book and to you today, I'm going to give you eight actions so a church can thrive while in transition. The first thing that needs to happen when a pastor steps away is the, the boat is rocking and someone needs to stabilize the church. As in an airplane, when turbulence hits, the pilots begin to look for the smooth air. And it's terrible to be in a church where there's a lot of turbulence, but pastoral endings and transitions can be very turbulent. There can be different thoughts of mind about who we should be looking at. Could we be looking at an internal staff member or should we be looking outside? Sometimes when an interim is the actual associate of the church, people begin to say, why not him? And yet the leadership in their heart of hearts knows that he is not prepared or he doesn't have the right mix of experience and aptitudes to be their next pastor. We call that division. It can be very turbulent. Um, when a pastor leaves under suspicion and the leadership needs to protect his, his privacy about why he left, often for legal reasons, or at least trying not to slander the man or woman, then therefore, this can be a turbulent time. Many, many things are turbulent about pastoral transitions. People get um, confused. Um, why did the pastor leave? Um, they're perplexed. They wonder, was he forced to leave? Um, or they are um, unclear. They're bewildered. A lot of emotions hit us when pastors announced the congregation they're leaving. When I was a young boy in my church in Virginia, at the age of 17, our pastor announced one Sunday that he was leaving. It was a shock to the leadership. It was a shock to us. But at the end of the sermon, he read his resignation that he was being called to a new church. Um, we felt just like death had occurred. We felt grieved. This was the pastor that really mentored and discipled me from the age of 13 to 17 to go from just salvation um, at the age of nine to being a true disciple at the age of 15, 16, and 17. It's very disorienting. Um, some people are upset. They grieve. They, they mourn. When my pastor was having his farewell dinner on a, one of the evenings at the church and everyone was down in the, the basement fellowship hall eating and celebrating them, I came back up to the sanctuary and realized that he was sitting there. And I said to him, and we called our pastor's mister, I said, Mr. Carfrey, you're crying. What, what's wrong? He says, I really don't want to leave these people. I love it here. And yet he was following, even apart from the loss and grief, his new calling. Some people are very calm. Um, they've seen this happen before. Uh, they may even think there was a justifiable need. So they're not upset at all. Some are sad. And there are some people that are actually glad and they're rejoicing upsets and brings division with the people that are sad. So that we're having different responses. Some are accepting and some are questioning. We're searching for smooth air. And what occurs in the first 60 days when a pastor's departure is announced is going to have at least six months to six years of repercussions, if not handled correctly. Of course, the leadership has to get together and decide who's going to preach, who's going to keep the staff, who's going to keep the ministries of the church running on, who's going to do the shepherding of the congregation. There should be an immediate quick fix, but I'm saying that once they cover the bases for eight or nine weeks, that the wisest thing they can do is to look toward an interim pastor who is intentional, skilled, seasoned, and strategic. Number two, we have to eliminate the challenges. We have to clear the runway like these machines are clearing the runway of an airport in the middle of a blizzard. Yes, um, there are things that cause blockages in the life of the church. There are things that are traditions or attitudes or, or characteristics 
or omissions that are keeping the church from gaining altitude or ascending and following God to his upward call in Christ Jesus. Let's just talk about a few of these common spiritual and strategic issues. <clears throat> I believe, and my second author believes, that the greatest issue is the failure to intentionally live into a God-given future or vision. I mean, we should wake up every day and run with the gazelles as pastors, not just running to get a sermon ready or to go to a meeting or to perform a, a wedding or funeral, but looking comprehensively at the Great Commission and how the church is fulfilling the Great Commission through a God-given vision of their neighborhood, their community, their resources to reach upward and onward. There's another issue too, and that's the lack of leadership. Um, pastors can fail at this. Some aren't really dedicated leaders, but everyone can practice good leadership. Sometimes the, the board of the church, whatever your title is, can be a, a group that's maybe passive, or they oversteer, or there's one who's a power broker, <clears throat> or they've made a bad decision and lost the confidence of the congregation. Um, a church can be inward focused and forget that a good part of the Great Commission, as evidenced in Matthew 28, is going. And that's initiating sharing the gospel with others as lived out in the book of Acts with the apostles and all that went out to share the Lord with others. When we start getting inward focused, then we start decreasing the, um, the new believers, the, the new ones, and incorporating into the life of the church. Sometimes there's a resistance to change, or the church is just not in a good spiritual place. There's a prayerlessness. There's some kind of idol. There's some kind of distraction. Uh, power control and issues, um, little or no disciple making. Sometimes our programs and the way we organize a church is very multi-layer and ineffective. And then we have churches that are aging without reaching the next generation. And right now in America, sort of post-COVID, not quite post-COVID, because there's resurgences and then a kind of a lowering, but we are seeing so many churches that have lost um, a generation or two of people. They were aging and now they're aging even more. Common spiritual and strategic issues, clearing the runway. A lot of churches just say, well, let's leave these problems to the next pastor. Let's just to kick the can down the street. And when they're kicking the can down the street, before the pastor arrives, they're actually kicking it to his front yard. And often churches have pastors that come who, par parabolically speaking, have a yard full of cans that are undealt with issues that are all in themselves landmines that can explode and ruin that pastor's tenure. Uh, I believe that churches in transition can strengthen with their leadership. There's no leader who's encouraged enough, resourced enough, taught enough, um, worked with enough in any church in America. It actually, it's an omission how we just elect someone or pick someone out without having some kind of preparatory training on what leadership in governance is like biblically. A couple of years ago, I went to Memphis to visit one of the churches that we were serving. And I, um, and this is Dan Worthman with me. And on Saturday, one of the elders of the church took us to FedEx um, Center there at the airport in Memphis. We got to step into a 30 million a dollar Boeing simulator. And for an hour and a half, we practiced taking off and landings and just had the time of our life. Um, well, one of the little funny side stories is that toward the end, thinking that I had advanced skills, the instructor said, let's take you to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong has these tall mountains and you have to come down and make a right-hand turn. And I was descending, descending, and sending in all of a sudden, I did it. I, I, I put it in the water. The mounds are in front of me. I ran it up on shore, and the whole picture in front of me exploded. You know, that can happen when you have novices who are um, 
um, leading churches or people that lack the right uh, training or spiritual development. Um, one of the things I learned was that it, in FedEx, every pilot has to come back every six months to take a retraining or refresher course. They go through the normal practices and then they practice every conceivable emergency situation that is out there. So they're prepared when that situation possibly pops up. If pilots need to have continuing education, I think leadership needs continuing influences of strengthening and knowledge and skill development. So they need to spend time in the spiritual simulator. So what are the leadership capacity issues of people that are on board as leaders in transition? Um, what actions need to be taken to improve unity and community among leaders in the church? Sometimes they're divided. Sometimes they just fly in or walk in once a month to do a meeting and recess and go home and maybe say hello on Sunday mornings, but they're not a true community. And when dissension or differences occur, there is not a base of trust and communication built to resolve them. And then we have division at the leadership level. What is the church's system for identifying training and developing leaders on an ongoing basis? Um, we need to have a pipeline whereby people are being matured in, in, in spiritual growth, but also workmanship growth or leadership growth. Everybody needs assistance to become all that God has made them to be in their personal ministries, as well as in the ministry of the church. What's our system for doing that? Really, without prayer, um, we are really um, totally inadequate. And we say that we believe that dependence on God is um, paramount. Without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. Ask, it shall be given to you. So we need to be uh, leaders, and we need to encourage and pray for our leaders, because truly in a church, we climb as we're on our knees. We descend as we're on our feet. We need to be a praying church. One of the churches I served, we did 100 days of prayer in groups of threes. And that 100 days, and they met 10 times, and over half the congregation volunteered to be in a group of three was transformational because we were at the point of visioning and they were able to feed back to us thoughts about mission, vision values and possibilities and opportunities. And so when the vision was realized and received, we believe from God, it was because the base of it had been a season of not only classroom chalkboard work, but also a season of deep, deep prayer by the people doing the work and by the whole congregation. Here's the deal. The best leaders lead from their knees. So are we a group of people that are leading the church that we drop to our needs, physically or at least attitudinally to come before the Lord in prayer and dependence, seeking his wisdom and his will? A church can become a C3 church in transition. This is sort of the visioning piece. We can really focus on the Great Commission. We can realize those enduring core values, not style, not particularly music, not environment, not the way that we present in dress or dialogue on Sundays, but more importantly, deep core biblical values. Although the Great Commission has a part about evangelism in it, a part about mentoring and maturing believers, and a part about extending that to our neighbor, to our friends and family through gospel witness here across town, across the country, to the uttermost parts of the earth, a Great Commission focus is needful. Those values, I think in Acts chapter 2, we see what was important. They worshiped, they instructed, they fellowshiped, they evangelized, and they served, and they gave. <clears throat> All important eternal values for a really church that soars.
and then being able to seek God in prayer, in dialogue, congregationally could be involved to be able to catch a captivating vision that doesn't push us, but pulls us into God's future. So is the Great Commission the mission of your church? What are your enduring core values? Are your leaders and hopefully your people captivated by God's vision? And do you reflect the characteristics of the very early Christian church, particularly the book in the book of Acts? There's another thing that can be accomplished. The church can align itself around God's vision in three primary areas. Every church constantly needs to be doing this, whether they're pastorless or in the middle of a very successful season with their settled pastor. That would be good discipleship, making disciples. Preaching is a part of that, but it's not the totality of that. We should mirror and model the way Jesus trained the 12. F.F. F. Bruce has a book called The Training of the Twelve, whereby we learn from Jesus great principles and practices of helping others become mature and committed and productive followers of Christ. Uh, developing leaders, we talked about that earlier, but we need to constantly be doing that as a church, or we're going to end up not having a, a pool to pick from of godly resource people as teachers, as small group leaders, as deacons, as, as members of the leadership of the church. And then we need to always have dynamic innovation. So do our current processes, programs, and ministries align with God's empowering vision? Every ministry of the church should, should be able to fulfill that vision and point back to how they are supporting it. Do they intentionally support disciple-making, developing leaders, and dynamic, innovative execution? And how do you measure this intentionality and the impact it's having on disciple-making, leadership development, and dynamic, innovative execution? I can tell you that when I was between the ages of 13 and 17, my pastor who came at the age of 25 invested in the youth as well as in all people and from that came a number of us that felt called to Christian service and a number of us that went deep in witness, even in our junior and high schools, because of the discipleship that we received. Um, then we need to call number seven, a P3 lead pastor. Yes, there's lots of qualities, educational qualities, experience qualities, preaching competency, leadership competency. But beyond that, we need pastors that are passionate in their own personal following the Lord. They need to be passionate in the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the word of God, and the mobilization of the body to fulfill the evangelism mandate, the disciple mandate, and the extension mandate of witness here and abroad. They need to wake up in the morning and run with the gazelles to be proactive and not reactive, to be thinking, leadership, pastoring, thinking how today I'm going to be pushing the ball up the hill as we lead our church forth with vision. And thirdly, they need to be personable. The ministry really is not for people who are um, impersonal. Uh, people want to know their pastor cares about them, is interested about them, looks them in the eye, gives them a good handshake, asks about them, listens about them. Now, as we get into larger churches, the lead pastor is going to do that with his immediate staff and extended staff, and he will do it as much as possible from the preaching on Sunday morning. But in middle-sized to small churches, personableness is extremely important. Rick Warren said a number of years ago, you'd grow a church to 400 through shepherding. You grow it above 400 with leadership. And I would say that we should remember the relational peace of loving sheep. Sheep sometimes aren't, aren't obedient. Sometimes sheep can stink. And sometimes people are hard to get along with. They're hard to love. They hurt us. We probably sometimes unintentionally hurt them. But personableness and relatability is so important. Uh, it's been a while ago now, January 15th, 2009, 
U.S. Airways flight took off out of LaGuardia Airport in New York City. And you remember the story, 60 seconds into the flight, the plane ran through a flock of geese and killed the engines. Anxiety filled the cockpit and the passenger cabin, much like the anxiety that fills a church when a pastor leaves. This has been well documented, the story in the movie called Miracle on the Hudson. But there was only a couple minutes to make and land this, make a decision and land this plane. The, the um, airport uh, said, take it to Terraboro Airport, not far away. But the captain knew that he didn't have enough time. He was descending too quickly to make it to that airport. And he said, we're going into the Hudson. And on that cold morning, about 45 degrees, he lined that thing up down the river, asked the people to brace for impact. And he brought the plane down with low probability of success, one of the greatest water landings ever. The plane skipped across the water, but no wing dipped and caused the plane to tumble and it landed peaceably upon the water. It rocked in the water and everybody gave a sigh of relief. All the people on the plane, 155, they all escaped, they all were healthy, they all survived. It was a wonderful story. And I note to you that if you haven't seen the movie recently, it'd be worth watching it again. Why was it possible for this plane to land? and these people to be saved because of the wisdom, experience, the um, capabilities of a non-anxious presence in the cockpit, a calm captain who under distress, out of years of experience, training and experience, drew all that together and was able to bring them in safely. What if the pilot on this plane was less than a Sully Sullenberg. What if this was his first flight as a captain of an Airbus 320? What if even landing on the water was a crazy idea to him? Then no doubt 155 lives and many possibly on the land would have perished. I believe every church in transition needs and deserves a Sully Sullenberg sort of intentional interim pastor. The experience, the training, the life lessons, maybe the coaching, the education about transition gives them the capability to more probably land a church so a new pastor can get on. They came in with momentum. They take off with momentum. The church is prepared for its future, and it flies higher, and it flies further. I believe that Every church should connect with a sully. And I believe that churches in transition need the gray hairs who have combat experience, who've been flying the plane of faith for a long, long time. In our organization, you have to be at least 50 to serve, and you have to have at least 15 years of quality pastoral experience. You have to be willing to take initial two days of training out of a 130 page manual. You need to be willing to learn new tools and new processes. You need to be willing to be coached. You need to go through a very strenuous application process. And then when you're there with your coach and with your new learning, you build upon lifetime learning and you can be sort of like a Sully Sullenberg if you're the pastor that comes temporarily. Your church now or in the future will be between pastors. And there is an opportune moment, a tipping point that can move your church into health, vitality, and fruitfulness. Don't waste the most significant point in the church's history to direct it into its future, to iron out situations, to clean the runway, to strengthen leaders, to pray to God and see the outcomes of vision the outcomes of intentional disciple-making, innovation, leadership development, all based upon where God's leading us, who we are, 
And then with that kinds, those kind of markers, find a pastor that matches your church so there is a good fit, so that when they arrive, you have many, many, many years of fruitful, reproductive ministry. We need to catch the thermals of God and rise upon the wings of God so that we can soar into God's magnificent future. Soar during pastoral transition and continue to soar and high with your new pastor. So I have two questions for you today. Join me in thinking through them. Number one, for you that are pastors that are thinking about what's next, is interim ministry your encore career? Could this be what God has for you? I've had many pastors tell me they felt that they were more productive and more effective as an intentional interim pastor with a plan, a process, and tools and coaching than they ever were as a settled pastor. I had one pastor that had many, many years of successful longevity and ministry who said that the season of interim pastoring, and he did more than 10 churches, was to him the cherry on the icing of the cape. It was the capstone of a life of learning. When I became the president, I felt inadequate, but I was challenged that this was the conversion of all my education, all my lifetime training, all my passions to be able to not only do the work of entering pastoring with intentionality, but to lead the work and lead this mission that is so very important. Consider interim pastor ministries. We need pastors that have great track records, that are godly, that have this passion to serve in this way. And do you know of a church that needs an S3 interim pastor that's seasoned, skilled, and strategic? If you know of such a church that in the near future will be needing someone like this, or currently is in transition looking for solutions, guide them to interim pastor ministries. Google interim pastors, and you will find us very quickly. I believe you can go forth with confidence in transitions with this alternative, but I think formally very important way to transition with experienced and wise interim pastors for your transition. If you've liked this today, I encourage you to hear more about it from my book, Soaring Between Pastors, Eight Actions to Thrive During the Pastoral Transition. It's been good to be with you today. Thank you for joining me. God bless. And we'll see you together in the clouds as we climb toward God's preferred future for our lives and the lives of our church.